Frontal stenosis is very important cause that which we should not miss. Let it be adult or let it be uh, any uh, uh, old age patient, young patient that we are examining. Many of the times patients are on the chronic medical therapy, let it be glaucoma cases, which can have a punctal stenosis as a, one of the adverse effects of the drugs that they are using. And the punctal stenosis need intervention, especially what we have, we have shown in the stage 3 and 4 where the drainage pathway is affected and patient has a constant epiphora. This for a few small conditions I just wanted to uh, highlight. Eublepharon, trichiasis, and congenital glaucoma. Again, these are one of the few conditions which uh, do have a, uh, are the causes of the watering and should be looked after. So, only looking at the eyelid is not your workup, or only looking at the lacrimal apparatus is not the complete workup of Epiphora, but you need to see uh, for the congenital glaucoma, tracheasis, and also for uh, the ocular surface disorder. This is just a classification. Now, this uh, last part of my presentation, I just want to highlight. This is one of the first things that we do learn in our residency, but we still keep on doing with the wrong technique. So, very important is you need to dilate the punctum and the canaliculus, pull the eyelid temporarily to straighten the ampulla, and then go at the I'll be just finishing in 30 seconds. And then go ahead with your sac syringing. Uh, probing again, uh, you need to interpret your probing very properly. Either you can do on slit lamp or anywhere. For doing your sac syringing, again, I would like to highlight that it's preferable to use a glass syringe instead of the normal BD syringe that we use in our OPD. Um, uh, soft, uh, soft stop that we feel is basically blockage in the canalicular system. And the hard stop is basically a no complete obstruction in the canalicular. It's normal. Something that I would like to uh, highlight or maybe uh, go ahead with this is a uh, patient telling you that the fluid reflects through the same canalicular. It's a canalicular block. Clear fluid reflexes through the opposite canaliculus. It's a common canalicular block. Reflex of the slight mucoid discharge from the opposite canaliculus uh -huh. after a few seconds. Is so NLD. Sorry to interrupt, doctor. Yeah. But the time is up. I would request you to please sum up within a minute. Yeah. So, epiphora should be differentiated from the lacrimation. Uh, well done syringing and probing helps diagnostic exact pathology. DCR plus minus intubation is important surgical procedure. Every ophthalmologist should learn. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sumit, for your wonderful presentation. We now move to our next presenter, that's Dr. Akshay. He's from Mumbai and he's going to enlighten us about the congenital nasolacrimal duct obstruction. Over to you, Dr. Akshay. Yeah, I'm just sharing my screen in a second. Right. Uh, so congenital nasolacrimal duct obstruction is uh, something that uh, all oculoplastic surgeons and general ophthalmologists as well as pediatric ophthalmologists encounter. So I'll be giving a stepwise pattern of how to diagnose and treat this condition. Uh, so the lacrimal system, as we know, includes everything, right? From the tear secretion in the lacrimal gland to the conjunctival cul-de-sac the puncta, the canaliculi, the nasolacrimal duct, and then the uh, valve of Hassner where it opens into the nose. And an obstruction at any of the levels of the drainage system can lead to epiphora uh, in, in adults as well as in children. In children, however, this is typically seen at the lower end, which is the opening of the nasolacrimal duct uh, under the inferior turbinate, because typically what happens is there is an incomplete canalization where there is a membrane at the opening over the valve of Hassner. Now, 95% of children who are born with a membrane at the uh, valve of Hassner, uh, this condition resolves by the first month of life. And in the 5% in whom this hasn't resolved by the first month of life, 96% of those 5% resolve by the end of one year spontaneously which actually leaves a very small sub subset of patients in whom we actually see the uh, CNLD presenting to us uh, even beyond a year's 
of age. And that is which is why this age of one year is very crucial for us. How does it present? It can present to us in multiple ways. I can see in the top left, there is crusting over the eyelashes. Uh, top right, there is a dacryocystocele. There is a mass presenting with a bluish hue. There could be a lacrimal fistula in the middle left. Uh, the middle right is acute dacryocystitis, as is the top bottom left, which is evolving into orbital cellulitis. In rare cases, you know, causes of congenite uh, epiphora can also show uh, a, a fistula through which it is draining, tears are draining. There can be other conditions that mimic CNLDO like supernumerary puncta or punctal agenesis, which is why, as Dr. Sumit mentioned, a detailed history and evaluation is ex extremely important before coming to a diagnosis. Now in adults, as was demonstrated beautifully how you should do a syringing, it is easy to come up with a diagnosis because syringing can be done in the outpatient uh, in adults. But in children, it's not that easy because children are not obviously not that cooperative, which is why it, the signs are far more important to look out for matted lashes, crusting that we saw in the previous picture, picture and rope loss or regurgitation over pressure over the lacrimal sac area. Pressing over the lacrimal sac area, uh, you can see regurgitation from the puncta into the conjunctival cul de sac. And finally, FDDT, which is fluorescein dye disappearance test. If you see the bottom photograph, this is FDDT, which is we will put in a drop of paracaine, stain the conjunctival tears or the, the, the cornea with fluorescein, and allow the patient uh, to normally blink for up to three to five minutes. Now, typically at the end of two minutes and at the end of five minutes, you should see partial clearance and complete clearance of fluorescein. And in, in patients who have a delayed FDDT, even at three or five minutes, you know that there is possible, probably an obstruction in the drainage of the tears. So what is standard textbook teaching that we keep learning about? Is that any child who presents to us with congenital nasolacrimal duct obstruction, the treatment of choice is lacrimal sac massage. Now, this is where I have an issue because this is not a massage that we are doing. What we are doing is compression and there's this wonderful editorial written uh, because this is a massage and this is not what we are doing. We are doing compression. And this editorial in the JPOS was, was extremely well in highlighting that once you say massage, it conveys a different meaning to the parents and they do what a massage is to them. So, uh, you know, like say, for example, this gentleman who, who was described by their ophthalmologist how to do it and they have been doing uh, lacrimal sac compressions for about three months and I asked him to demonstrate what he was doing. And you can see this kind of a lacrimal sac compression is absolutely pointless. He's massaging the side of his nose. So we need to demonstrate what it is, how it is done, how lacrimal sac compressions are done. The point and the purpose of this lacrimal sac compression is to press over the lacrimal sac area such that the intracystic or these, the pressure within the sac, the hydrostatic pressure increases such that there is a give way at the lower end of the valve of Hasler and the membrane gives way. This is the aim behind lacrimal sac compression. So what I prefer to do is to demonstrate it on the parent or the attendant who is accompanying the child. Do, do it on the child in front of them. Do it on the parent or the, or the, the uh, person who's a mother who's accompanying the child. And then there is a WhatsApp clip that we record of me doing it on the child and send it to the parent. Ask them to watch this each time that they do it for the first few days. Obviously it has to be done 10 times a day, each uh, repetition for being done four times throughout the day. So by doing this and demonstrating how it is being done, it helps. And this is a clip that Dr. Swati Singh had come up with, which is extremely useful in demonstrating what needs to be done. It shows the area to be pressed, it shows the finger, and it also shows the direction in which the compression has to be done. You need to occlude the common canalicular opening while you compress on the lacrimal sac. And this demonstration with the animation really helps in getting patients to parents to understand what it is that we need to do. And uh, we've seen that compliance and outcomes have improved since the demonstration is better. So simply telling that this treatment has to be done doesn't help. And what after one year is over? We can see that the spontaneous resolution probability by the time the child exceeds one year is 0%.
So we see children beyond the age of one year still being advised through uh, you know, conservative management with compression that doesn't work. In these cases, probing has to be done. My cutoff is 12 months. It is done under anesthesia with endoscopic guidance. And the reason uh, why endoscopic guidance is that CNLDO is not always simple CNLDO. These are complex variants of CNLDO where you have a, a buried probe, you have a, a, a bony obstruction, you have incomplete canalization uh, or aberrant opening into the septum, etc. So you need uh, into the lateral ball, etc. So you need to be very, very uh, clear of what you're dealing with. A simple putting an endoscope, the purpose of putting an endoscope is to be able to visualize with certainty that the probe that you put in through the canaliculus, uh, through the punctum in the canaliculus, is visualized under the inferior turbinate. Now, that is the inferior turbinate. That is where the uh, opening of the nasolacrimal duct should be. And you can see that there is a metal probe coming. Metal to metal contact or direct visualization is sufficient. Very rarely, you can have cases where you have congenital dacryocele or dacryocystoceles. This is an imperforate membrane at the level of valve of Hassner and a functional block at the level of the common canaliculus. So what do you need to do in these cases? You need to make sure to rule out an intranasal cyst, which is seen that, which is something that accompanies a lot of patients with dacryocystoceles. So the best way to treat this condition is to perform a, a cruciate marsupialization. The reason being that you can see that the entire nasal passage is blocked by this. So especially in, in children with, uh, who are being breastfed uh, on the contralateral side, the mother's breast is compressing the other side of the nostril and the intranasal cyst is compressing this side of the nostril so the child can have respiratory distress. Cruciate incisions are made. The purulent material through the intra, in the intranasal cyst and the dacryocele is drained out. This is a single incision, but then you need to put it, uh, put your, uh, uh, use a crescent knife or a sickle uh, blade and create a cruciate incision such that the four leaflets spread apart as healing goes on. And this can help you in going from this to this and the, the early probing in these cases is, is advisable. Conservative compression in dacryocystoceles is not preferred. You would rather probe early. So in children who have never been probed, I am inclined to give a trial of probing up to eight years. Between eight to five years, I advise the parents that I will do a trial of probing, but these cases tend to be complex NLDO with either an imperforate uh, canalization, uh, incomplete canalization or bony block or a deviated nasal lacrimal duct opening. So these cases, a trial of probing is offered, but on table, if you feel a DCR is needed, then a DCR is done. Children with CNLDO who have come presented uh, beyond the age of eight, eight, I prefer to directly go in for a DCR. The reason why a, the cutoff of DCR is five years is that it is believed the sinus pneumatization occurs and is completed up to 90% by the age of five. So pediatric DCRs, uh, like I mentioned, stent is placed in most of my patients. I prefer to use mitromycin C. An endoscopic route can be preferred, although for pediatric DCR, I am still more inclined towards the external route. One small thing that I'd like to comment on is the recent advancements in balloon dacryoplasty. Uh, so this is preferred in CNLDO obstructions which have failed previously or in syndromic associations. Literature suggests multiple rates uh, of success. Now what is done is that you initially dilate the punctum and you have what is called a lacry cath, which is similar to an angioplasty balloon. You introduce it down till the metallic stent is visualized at the end of the turbinate. So you're at the same time doing a probing as well. Uh, once you visualize it, then up it is inflated up to eight atmospheric pressure for 90 seconds. And once it is kept inflated for 90 seconds, it is deflated. Again, it is uh, the same process is repeated where you slowly increase the pressure within the stent to nine, eight, atmospheric, uh, eight atmospheres and then keep it come back. Following this, you pull it out a little till it is in the lacrimal sac and again dilate it. So to summarize, CNLDO is a common condition that can be conservatively managed till the age of one year with appropriate probing advice. One year is the threshold, appropriate conservative massage. One year is the threshold for probing. Uh, 
up to five years, I'm, you know, one can give a trial of probing with endoscoping is recommended while probing and following the age of five years, a DCR can be advised and you have successful outcomes in these patients. Thank you so much. Uh, that was fantastic, Dr. Akshay, and thank you for sticking to the time. A lovely comprehensive overview of the CNLDO here. Let's move on to our next speaker. And I'd like to introduce Dr. Salil Mondal, who is an associate professor at RIO Medical College, Calcutta. And he's here to give us some tips and tricks on how to do a successful external DCR. Over to you, Dr. Salil Mondal, please. Hello. Hello. Yes, sir. I'm audible. I'm audible. Yes, sir. We can hear you, sir. Welcome, sir. Okay. Okay. Slide. Slide is with. Uh, Hello. Yes, sir. We My can see your slide, sir. Okay. Enlarge. Enlarge. So the successful external DCR that takes and tips. So on dactyl sister rhinos to be the, is the most common genetic surgery performing our uh, ophthalmology to cataract surgery. Epiphora is a common problem in the middle-aged people, uh, female age, uh, low, to, uh, low to middle socioeconomic status of a females are most commonly involved in uh, NLD system problem. The surgery consists of making a permanent fistula between the lacrimal sac and the middle meters, intervening pass through the uh, bony opening and the anastomosis made, through which the uh, it is relieved and discharge is relieved. Indication is per per persistent congenital Nasal lacrimal duct obstruction, congenital lacrimal duct obstruction, primary acquired NLDO, secondary acquired NLDO, inflammatory sinusoidal disease, prior midfacial surgery, a recurrent acute out of a chronic diagnosis. Another indication we can do a bypass surgery is called chronic diagnosis type. Contraindication of the diameter disease of the sac. The malignancy of the sac, the presence of canicular block proximal to the colonic glandulus, atrophic rhinitis, unstable hemodynamic and systemic condition. So these are the condition we are uh, uh, one, not wanted to do at this year surgery. Preoperative syringing, uh, previous speaker described the syringing uh, thoroughly because most of the syringing can be must be done from the heart clinically, not to disturb a low bunk or in clinically. And then the next uh, uh, seat is a field. It, uh, it is a dye injected in the analysis system and take a photograph, um, a translateral view on AP view that will help in the amount of sac level of blood that should be determined by the dactyl cystography. Then you can do your planning of the surgery when we can do it. Stable flap surgery, we can do a double flap surgery. The status of the sac, any dacrolate, any stone that can be easily diagnosed by dacrocystography, but this is not possible in all the hospitals. This comes to a joint diagnosis, is the dye is split into the conjunctival sac and uh, swab is taken from the natal after five minutes. And if it is stained, it's stained, it's patent, it's not stained, it is not patent, it's a block. Syringe or dacrocystography. The most important is the base blood investigation, especially coagulation profile. So the patient must be a good normal PTC coagulation term of uh, the platelet count, even also with blood grouping. Also, well controlled BP and blood glucose level is essential for this DCR patient, success of the DCR patient. And next time to our ENT colleague right now, we are very close to work with the ENT people <laughs> due to mycormycosis. And every day I have to go to the ENT department to search for excentration. So ENT people helps the status of the nasal cavity 
where the, uh, we do a part of surgery into the middle meter for successful DCS surgery. In the nasal cavity, pre-medicated with the congestion like the xylometazoline. Anesthesia, this local anesthesia, most commonly given both infiltration and topical anesthesia. It is, is 2% lignocaine and topical anesthesia is 5% uh, propanic and hydroclite, 0.5% propanic and hydroclite into the nasal sac. And the area of infiltrated that is more fibrotic head light to become nasal, nasal force. Nasal was predicted with methicillin and used xylem and jelly uh, to for good nasal plug good nasal plaque health in a good surgery of DCR, on a full surgery of the DCR. The nasal pack, nasal pack entered, entered into the head of the middle turbinate and inferior turbinate adjusted to the lacrimal fossa with the force directed towards the medial canthus. This nasal pack, if it's a good nasal pack, that means it's impinged the nasal mucosa. But it should be burning. Otherwise, if there is a space between the Mucosal wall, nasal mucosal wall, and the, the chance of bleeding is more. It also helps with hemostasis, also being because it's a drop and xylophen with adrenaline. Nasal pack, let's see too, for uh, sometimes before a nasal mucosa incision. So, now, box, this is infra orbital, infra ethmoidal nerve. This is the infra ethmoidal nerve. This is the infra orbital dorsal nerve block. This is the infratrox or separatrox block. Also, the anesthesia given to him into the incisional line. This is the incisional line that given it. This incisional line will give it incision uh, block of xylocaine uh, with adrenaline. So, anesthesia, the skin, the middle lower, uh, middle, lower and upper lid infiltrated approximately five layers away from the lid margin you need to avoid the <coughs> marginal vessel until it is started. To the carangal up to 10 degrees per minute for the orbit. And also during surgery, we can do a, a spraying of xylip in the adrenaline in bulk. Carvilinear or a straight incision, we prefer the carvilinear incision, it's 10 to 12 millimeter length and 3 millimeter width, a 2 millimeter for the help of the patient. Sac dissection, skin is separated from the lying or dissection is done until the middle cancel tendon. Periosteum is identified, divided. Periosteum along with sac is inflated, uh, reflected from the bony wall and so of the lacrimal circle is exposed. So bone, bony surface to be punctured is the laminar papyrus of the ethmoid, then it comes uh, uh, from before to backwards and then a play of the upcutting bone part that is subtly and or gets on more than and clearly enlarge the bony opening. This bony opening should be 16 to 10 to 16 meter in diameter and the margin should be regular and there should not be any bony projection. Superiorly, it goes up to till 2 millimeter above the medial cancers, inferiorly till the NLD is partially. Inferiorly, up to the punch, uh, until the punch cannot be inserted to the bone and nasal mucus. So flap creation, first to create the sap after the making of the bony opening, you do a flap creation. First of all, to sack lumens, identify the passing the Bowman's probe. It's divided in a flap with the 11 blade. Flaps are made uh, with a vertical incision. Then you go to the nasal flap. So if you want to do a single surgery, you can do a U-shaped nasal flap. We can join the anterior flap of the sac. We can make a single flap surgery. In a double flap surgery, we can do a H-shaped incision or flap creation, the anterior posterior flap, both anterior flap of the sac and, uh, and uh, post anterior flap of the nasal mucosa join, and posterior flap of the nasal mucosa and uh, sac mucosa join to make a double flap. After making this swap, you should give a hitching suture to join to tuck with the periosteum to prevent the sacking down of this flap. Flap double flap surgery is much more physiological, but it is difficult to do. In the study shows if a single flap and double flap surgery with the result is same. So you should go for a easy procedure. It's a single flap surgery is recommended. Sometimes we do a no flap surgery when the fibrosac is there and the nasal mucosa is lost due to 
uh, punch, uh, which is used or the mic uh, is lost due to, uh, during surgery when using a bony uh, punch. Once the flaps is secured, orbicularis muscles is uh, situated with the 4 g polyglactin and skin with the 4 g silk. So now, in, now we uh, try intubation DCR in double threaded 1 g silk suture in a, a rural setup in a hospital which is not well, if we can do a DCR surgery with successful functionally anatomically patent DCR, we do a single entry of flap or no flap surgery can be performed. Double threaded 1 0 silk as a stent material we are using here. During the surgery, the nasal mucosa is exposed to a U-shaped flap, single anterior flap, and um, much more thereby incurring good hemostasis. Of the planted to prevent the soft to then it's passed through the NLD. Now so this is a body needle which is uh, tip is broken and it is straightened and the eye of the needle is entangled with the suture one zero silk. Once then we do pass through the comes through the inferior uh, canaliculi into the common canaliculi and is passed then again, it passes through, through the DCR owned or anastomosis and stoma. It comes to the of at portal. After that, we do a thread like this. This a loop of thread is, is outside. It, this double threaded silk is staying as a stent material. And this is publication. Tips of the homostasis. Good. A good hemostasis that you can control by HTN, use a adrenaline, good nasal packing, have no nervous uh, suction device. Use of mitomycin C, intuition DCR indicated and failed DCR, traumatic endo, canalicular problem, poor flap reconstruction. Post traumatic error, nasal packing is good oral in uh, oral antibiotic, the patient is removed the six when twelve weeks. Complication, owned infection, owned patients, own bleeding, from the tube, fibrosis, web facial scar, failed DCR, persistent. So, successful DCR is one where there is both anatomical as well as functional patency. Passage should be patent on syringing and the patient should be free of symptom. The reported success rate of external DCR varies between 88 to 99%. Presumed to be much higher as a compared to endonasal transcanalic disease. But in the literature, just per result, thank you so much, Doctor. Uh, we are glad that you concluded it on time over to uh, dr sukdeep uh, thank you so much sir for such an informative session next uh, i invite uh, usha ma'am it's an honor and a pleasure to invite my mentor and dr sonam told me to keep it short but when it comes to speaking about your mentor no words are enough. Over to you, ma'am. Just a second, ma'am. I'm just getting my... I'm sorry. Is it visible? Uh, yes, ma'am. And audible also? Yes, ma'am. Yes. So uh, I think, uh, thank you, the organizing committee, the chairs and the moderator. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I, I think I'll be uh, talking about a subject that's a, a little different from the procedures and the protocols that we're following. It's more to emphasize the importance of a particular test that needs to be done, especially in cataract surgery. And the reason the cataract surgery is in focus is because that seems to be the highest priority as of now in terms of the surgical numbers. So I'll just go through what actually 
is happening. Uh, normally, the cataract surgery focuses on the visual outcome, which has become excellent these days because of the evolving techniques and the technology. The, undoubtedly, people have surpassed uh, the their own uh, outcomes, and uh, it has been uh, uh, the outcomes have changed, but the uh, complications haven't changed much in terms of uh, the end of thalmitis, and uh, the rates have come down, but uh, still it's being the one of the most dreaded complication that is end of the end of thermitis and we all know that nld obstruction is one of the well established risk factor for uh, post operative end of thermitis and of course we've all shifted to use of povidone iodine which has been effective for surface clearance but it doesn't really help in the nasolacrimal duct clearance in terms of organisms so it is imperative for us to keep the nldo clear which means we need to do the proper testing in order to perform the surgery. So let's look at what are the tests that are available as of now for uh, confirming the occlusion in the lacrimal passage. Now, Rho plus is uh, one, which is uh, the regurgitation on pressure over the lacrimal sac. Syringing with saline has been uh, used. Fluorescein dye disappearance test, especially in this particular era, we've started doing a lot of uh, fluorescein dye disappearance test. Micro reflex test, nasal endoscopy, contrast dacryocystography. Then we have also used imaging alongside of scintigraphy. Yeah. Now let's look at the downsides. Jones one and two and the dye disappearance test. They there is an inability to estimate the level of obstruction. CT and MRI, particularly in craniofacial deformities, or when there is an injury and when there is a suspicion of neoplasia. The uh, MCDG, definitely very useful. It's better than syringing, but the access and the economic constraints prevent us from doing this as a routine procedure prior to cataract surgery. We're not talking small numbers. We are all talking about hundreds and millions of cataract surgery. So we should keep the economic constraints in our mind. So regurgitation is definitely a non-invasive procedure with minimal patient discomfort, and it's easy to perform in the outpatient setting by all either the ophthalmologists or the technicians, whoever is present there. Syringing is an invasive procedure. And uh, by, uh, from a survey by Akshay, we, are, we all know that it, it was a very well-conducted survey. 60% of them felt that Rho Plus is, was adequate for uh, uh, cataract surgeries. That is prior to cataract surgeries. This was done in 2015. But unfortunately, 30% felt the need to do a routine syringing. But those who have responded for wanting to do just Rho Plus have not really provided any reasons for why they did not prefer syringing. And this was not within the uh, purview of the uh, survey as well. So uh, I think uh, that's another aspect that needs to be dealt separately. So the Rho Plus test results are usually positive only in infected lacrimal duct obstruction with purulent material in the sac. So checking for NLD patency by Rho Plus alone has its advantages. The sensitivity of this test was not found to be sufficiently high enough to rule out a NLD obstruction. So this has to be borne in mind. Now, in a study conducted in 8,000 and odd patients without any history of epiphora or any other lacrimal disorders, these were patients who were scheduled to undergo cataract surgery where syringing was considered as a reference standard for detecting the obstruction in our study. So the ophthalmologist checked for regurgitation, assuming that they have full knowledge about the regurgitation, row plus test. And this is, this is what has been universally accepted and AIO's guidelines to spell it out very clearly that it has to be done by ophthalmologists. So reflux of fluid mucoid or purulent from the puncta was noted and mucoid or uh, purulent regurgitation from either or one of the puncta during row plus was considered to be positive for NLD obstruction. Now a syringing was carried out by a trained ophthalmic technician and regurgitation of, I, I think it was spelled out very clearly by the previous speaker. We knew where the NLD obstruction was, especially when there was a common canalicular obstruction or the same canalicular obstruction or when there was an atonic sac. There is a point to be noted. The fluid passes off very clearly into the nasopharynx, but there was a swelling noted in the atonic sac. So this also was very clearly depicted in the syringe. Okay, so all of these are identified. One, 
the NLD obstruction was well identified. The common canalicular obstruction was well identified. The canalicular obstruction was identified and an atonic sac was also identified using syringing. So in the 8,369 eyes, 61 patients with positive row plus and NLDO on syringing were diagnosed as chronic dacryocystitis. That was very clear. In 20 patients with positive row plus test, syringing test reported to have patent NLD. This was also very clear. So this showed that the patients had an atonic lacrimal sac. 51 patients with a negative row plus and NLD not patent with clear fluid through the opposite punctum with a hard stop are diagnosed as chronic dacryocystitis. 28 patients with a negative row plus and NLD patent with clear fluid through the opposite punctum with a soft stop was diagnosed as common canalicular obstruction. So the row plus test had a low sensitivity and a high specificity of detecting NLDO. So this was a paper which brought all of us to the point that we need not do syringing. A paper by Dr. Thomas et al., a famous ophthalmologist way back in 1997, uh, evaluated the sensitivity and specificity of Rho Plus as a screening test for chronic dacryocystitis and compared it to syringing in 621 consecutive patients who needed syringing for various reasons. Out of the 621, only 318 patients were scheduled for cataract surgery. Please note this point. And authors reported a moderate sensitivity and specificity of row plus of 85.7% and 99%. They concluded that in view of the opportunity cost, please note when row plus is negative, preoperative syringing in cataract is perhaps unnecessary. So we, on the contrary, found a much lower sensitivity of row plus that is 54.46% with the highest possible sensitivity being 63.9% in 95% of the cases. A diagnostic test with a low sensitivity will have a high level of false negative rate, meaning that when Rho plus was negative, the patient may be misclassified as not having NLDO in 45.53% of the patients that have obstruction. So we had a high specificity of 99.76%, which was very similar to the study of uh, by Thomas et al. A high specificity of a screening test indicates that if Rho plus is positive, chronic dacryocystitis is almost definitely present. There's no doubt about this. But in practice, especially prior to an intraocular uh, surgery, specificity can, uh, cannot be taken into consideration in isolation. So a positive predictive value and a negative predictive value are more appropriate. So we, so the PPV in our study was 75.31%. The NPV was 99.38, which is similar to the analysis of cataract surgery patients without lacrimal com complaints where uh, the positive predictive value was 75% and negative predictive value was 99.5% in a study by Thomas et al. So there was no difference there. But when Rho plus is positive in these cataract surgery patients, there's only 75.31% prob probability that the patient has been correctly identified as having an LDO. The prevalence of chronic dacryocystitis in our study was 1.35%, whereas in the study by Thomas et al. was around 6.6%, probably because of the fact that he included patients with complaints of epiphora, corneal ulcers, and routine cataracts, whereas in our study, it was exclusively cataract patients, those undergoing cataract surgeries. So even though the NPV was, is high, as a consequences of missing out on true positives, it there is a possibility of developing post-operative endophthalmitis, which is well-known and well-established. So we recommend routine preoperative syringing along with Rho Plus in cataract surgery patients or in fact in all intraocular surgeries. But since this is purely a, a, a cataract session, I would like to emphasize that it has to be done prior to cataract surgery. Syringing might be... NLD in places of atonic sac where Rho plus is positive. But major advantage here in, is the site of obstruction, which will help us to defi uh, define and define the treatment planning. Rho plus and syringing together may be made as a routine preoperative diagnostic test before cataract surgery.
So Roplas alone had a very low sensitivity and low positive predictive value in detecting NLDO prior to cataract surgery. Syringing improves diagnostic accuracy and aids in the treatment strategy after diagnosing the NLDO. Roplas and syringing in every patient should be part of the routine. Please remember every patient prior to cataract surgery must undergo SAC syringing to reduce post-operative endophthalmitis. So this has to be included in our tests. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am, for such a lovely session. And it will change the way we think about evaluating our patients prior to cataract surgery. It will definitely make a big change in the way we process the patients when it comes to evaluation. Thank you so much. Next, we, uh, I'd like to invite Dr. Surbhi, who is doing her fellowship at Shankar Netrale. She is going to do the case presentation. Over to you, Dr. Surbi. Yes, ma'am. I hope my screen is visible. Yes. Yes, doctor. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I'll be presenting a case titled, All That Is Red Is Not Conjunctivitis. A 58-year-old female presented to us with the complaints of watering of the left eye since, and redness along since one year. She was treated as a case of chronic conjunctivitis with topical antibiotics with no response to treatment. On examination, the visual activity in both the eyes was 6x, N6. Troplas was negative in both the eyes and syringing was patent in both the eyes. On examination and a closer look, there was a classic pouting of the lower punctum as well as pericanalicular uh, edema and congestion. And also there was a uh, expression of concretion and pus on compression of the lower canaliculus. The pus was sent for microbiological examination. Actinomyces was isolated and the patient was treated with ciprox ointment loading for, on alternate days for four days. This was the patient at presentation and this is the patient after fourth ointment loading dose. There was no expression of concretion from the lower canaliculus and the lacrimal passage was patent. After eight months of follow-up, there was no recurrence of the disease. Canaliculitis is the inflammation of the canalicular part of the lacrimal system, which accounts for less than 5% of all lacrimal diseases. Hence, it is often misdiagnosed. And also, there is a delay in diagnosis, and therefore, mean duration of symptoms is usually 8 to 10 months. The age of presentation is 4 to 6 decade of life, but it can occur in any age group. There is a female preponderance in the middle age, mostly because of hormonal changes during menopause, and also because of the use of cosmetics. The lower canaliculus is frequently involved and there is this uh, thinking that diverticulum or lacrimal like uh, occlusion can lead to stasis and pr promotes antibacterial uh, growth in the canaliculus. The patients may present with watering or discharge along with redness confined to the medial part of the eye as well as swelling of the medial part of the eyelid. A pouting punctum is the characteristic feature of a canaliculitis along with pericanalicular swelling. Concretion of pus discharge from the canaliculus and punctum is also a classic feature of conjunctivitis. And also the patient will present with conjunctivitis and mucopurulent discharge. Secondary canaliculitis, which occurs mostly due to use of punctal plugs, which le uh, leads to punctal granuloma and also blood stain discharge or uh, tears. Canaliculitis can be misdiagnosed as a case of conjunctivitis like this lady who presented with redness for six months and treated with a battery of topical antibiotics with no resolution. This should have raised a suspicion because on examination, there was a concretion projecting from the lower punctum, clinching the diagnosis of canaliculitis. Again, this uh, gentleman who was referred for incision and curators for a chalazion, on examination, there was pouting of the punctum pericanalicular edema, as well as pus discharge from the upper punctum, clinching the diagnosis of canaliculitis. It can also be confused with chronic dacryo cystitis. And this lady, she was presented to us for DCR surgery. On examination, there was peripunctal edema, pus discharge from the punctum, and the swelling was in the middle part of the eyelid. Whereas in chronic dacryo cystitis, the swelling will be in the area of lacrimal sac region. Staph or uh, Staphylococcus epidermidis is the most common mechanism responsible for canaliculitis. The treatment can be conservative, including warm compresses and topical antibiotics, but it has a high recurrence state because of the presence of concretions which do not allow the penetration of antibiotics. Minimally invasive uh, such, uh, treatment includes canalicular content expression as well as antibiotic loading or irrigation. 
Surgical treatment is for recalcitrant cases like for punctoplasty and curettage of canalicular contents or canaliculotomy with curettage. So a take home message is that any case of conjunctivitis or hordeolum, which is not responding to treatment should be treated as a DD of canaliculitis. In such cases, careful examination of the punctum is needed. Intracanalical ointment loading is an effective modality of treatment. And for recalcitrant cases, punctoplasty or canaliculotomy should be done. These are my acknowledgements. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Dr. Suruti. And bang on time there. And that was a lovely case presentation as well. Uh, I'd like to thank all the speakers for being bang on time. And we've learned so much. To summarize uh, what Dr. Sumit said, blink for blink uh, in teary eyes to examine the lid's ocular surface. Uh, Dr. Akshay beautifully comprehends uh, the entire conjunctival nasal acrimal duct obstruction with lovely pictorial depictions. And uh, Dr. Usha and Dr. Salil also, uh, thank you for your lovely uh, talks on um, DCR and uh, Dacry cystitis and cataract surgery. And that was a fantastic study, ma'am. So we have a couple of questions. We are now open to the floor uh, for the questions. And uh, one of the first questions uh, has been asked for uh, Dr. Salil Mandal. Dr. Milind uh, actually has asked the first question and he wanted to know the reference or the source for the pictures that had been used in the slide for anesthesia. So Dr. Salil Mandal. Yes, sir. Javed Ali's book. Hello, I'm audible. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You're audible. Hello. Yes, sir. It is from Javed Ali's book. Okay. It is from Javed Ali's book. Right. So <laughs> the source is from uh, Dr. It is from one of the Dr. LVPI. Yes, sir. Uh, the question has been asked by Dr. It is on the LVPI only. So. Right, sir. So that is, uh, thank you so much, sir, for the question. Uh, uh, so uh, we have another question. And uh, I would like to invite uh, our chairman, Dr. Um, Sunil Morekar, and our co-chairman, Dr. Saurabh Kamal, as well. Um, so there has been a question that has been asked by Dr. Gyan Bhaskar uh, to all the panelists, whether can cataract surgery be done in the other eye? If NLDO is present in the opposite sac. Uh, Usha, ma'am? Yeah, ideally, no, because that's a, you know that it's a source of infection. And I think it, it should not be, unless it's an impending, like a phacolytic, phacomorphic. Even then, in that, in that context, also, you can do a PCR. You can uh, endoscopically do it, or you can do a in fact, you can even do a DCT or allowed to do a DCT in the other eye and do the surgery subsequently. But if at all there is a scenario like this, what I normally would recommend is at our institute, we perform the DCR in the other eye and then go ahead and do the cataract surgery for the... Done. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. I hope that answers your question, Dr. Gyan Bhaskar. Um, I have a question uh, for our chairman and co-chairman. So uh, normally, David, uh, what is your experience with pediatric endoscopic DCRs? Uh, and would we recommend that since Dr. Akshay clearly said that external DCR would be the choice in case of recalcitrant cases where probing has failed? Can I take it? Yes, sir, please. So uh, we, we have been doing uh, endoscopy uh, uh, in pediatric uh, since quite some time. In our experience, uh, uh, there are two things that we have to look at in uh, endoscopy versus external. Uh, there is something which is called as uh, healing by primary intention, healing by secondary intention. So when you're healing by primary intention, you are suturing the, you're cutting a part, you're suturing it, you're keeping the tissues close together. When you're healing with secondary intention, you are, uh, this close together is kept with the help of sutures or is kept with the help of uh, 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 any other material like glue or sometimes uh, clips that we use. So healing by primary uh, intention definitely works much better. And that is what happens when you do an external DCR. When you do an endoscopic DCR, you are doing healing by what is called a secondary intention. So you, leave, you make a cut, you leave the cut on the other side, you expect that it will heal uh, across uh, in the way that you want to heal and it will not cover up the ostium. So uh, external definitely will do better. But what we have seen in our experience that whenever we do a suturing of the endoscopic flaps, 
it it works much better than the external DCR because you have the lacrimal pump intact plus you have healing by pathogen. But in endoscopic suturing in a child is extremely 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 difficult because it's a very small cavity there. So if if somebody is an expert in doing that, go ahead and do that. That will be better than the external DCR. But if it is not, then the external DCR definitely prefer. Right. So right. I would agree right. with uh, Akshay. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much. uh dr sunil i think in the interest of time uh we would uh, just like to wrap up the session any concluding words from dr saurabh kamal yeah hello thank you yeah i think it's a well organized uh, good topics and uh, much of thing uh, has been covered by the speakers and in the discussion uh, i just like to say uh, a few points that uh, uh, when coming across a case of an epi4i you know Uh, specifically if the patient have a ocular surface disease you should not like most of the patients you should not intervene because like these are the patients who have like uh, facial palsy steven johnson cicatricial pemphigoid or chronic conjunctivitis like herpes so for in them you need you know you need uh, tear secretions to be up uh, for their uh, specifically associated dry eye so uh, examine them carefully rule out any this chronic uh, conditions conjunctivitis specifically and even though you know they have uh, some kind of a punctal or canalicular obstruction they can be observed and they should be counseled accordingly because they, you know these patients keep on coming back and say they have a watery eye they have a watery eye uh, 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 specifically the facial palsy patient and uh, you know uh, nothing you will gain nothing by treating them and you should tell them you know uh, the uh, having tears is actually uh, good for good for them uh and the second thing is like the syringing uh, uh this is for the general ophthalmologist uh use a smaller cc syringe always use uh, like 2 uh, cc or even like 1 cc syringe because mostly the canal uh, the cannula which we are using uh are 25 to 27 gauge so i have seen in some centers like they uh, they, they give me like 10 cc syringe with uh, 25 or 27 gauge cannula and it's too too forceful you know to get the irrigation out of that uh, small uh, cannula so that thing should be kept in the mind right thank you thank you so much uh, dr saurabh and with that we wrap up our first session on dacryology uh, i'd like to thank the entire aio scientific committee and dr ferus for this um, over to the next session and uh, thank you so much dr nisar yeah, sonam yeah. punam yeah. it was great having such fantastic panelists and speakers on board for this session